Welcome to Tell Me About East Asia, a podcast presented by the Center for East Asian Studies at University of Arizona. CIS is a Title VI National Resource Center supported by the U.S. Department of Education. We assist and promote the study of East Asian languages and cultures across Southern Arizona and beyond. This episode is hosted by Dr. Scott Gregory, Associate Professor of East Asian Studies and Co-Director of CIS. We'd also like to welcome our guest, Dr. Ray DeChill, to the podcast. I'm here today with Dr. Ray DeShield, Associate Professor of Religious Studies and East Asian Studies here at the University of Arizona. Dr. DeShield is also the author of Searching for the Body, a Contemporary Perspective on Tibetan Buddhist Tantra, a book that was published by Columbia University Press in October 2022. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Scott. Uh, the first thing I wanted to ask is, um, how did you originally get interested in studying Tibetan and the Tibetan language and Tibetan Buddhism? So I was in college, I was already pretty interested in India. Um, I took an introductory class my freshman year um, on the cultures and arts of India. And I became interested in Indian art and religion. And I had as my undergraduate career went on, I had this amazing visiting professor, uh, Deborah Diamond, who became a curator for the Smithsonian eventually, who took us on a field trip to the Asia Society in Manhattan. Uh, and the Asia Society was having this exhibition, Mandala, the Architecture of Enlightenment. Uh, and at this exhibition, there were all sorts of depiction of mandala. So for those who don't know, a mandala is basically a celestial palace inhabited by Buddhas. And that palace can take many forms. So it can be represented by a painting, in which case then the mandala is like a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional form of a palace, but also sculptures and most famously sand mandalas, um, which have you know become very popular in various forms of media. So some listeners may have encountered sand mandala before, either in person or in television shows. So there were Tibetan monks at the museum creating a live sand mandala. And I was instantly captivated by what they were doing. I wanted to understand everything about this very complex, colorful, intricate form that they were making out of sand, <laughs> and which would eventually, after its completion, be ritually dissolved to purify the surrounding environment. And so before I even left the museum that day, I was planning how I was going to get back to New York <laughs> to see this exhibition again and talk more with these monks. And really, Mandala was my point of entry into the world of Tibetan Buddhism. So the art forms were really what sparked my curiosity and made me want to understand the religious tradition and eventually to be able to learn the language as well. So what was your was experience? <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah. What was your experience like learning the language? So initially, it was pretty daunting um, because unlike learning a romance language, there's no you know recognizable correlates, right? So I first started by just learning the alphabet and some very basic grammar with a Tibetan Lama that was living in New York City. Uh, and this was the time that I started applying for grad school. And initially I went to grad school to complete a master's, which I did complete uh, in Asian art history. And so I, at the same time as I was studying Asian art, I was also studying Tibetan language, uh, both in summer intensives at the University of Wisconsin's South Asian Summer Language Institute, um, as well as funded by uh, Title VI grants to study abroad uh, at the university um, in Lhasa, actually, Tibet University, Pujang oh. Um, and in Nepal as well. So I was really kind of getting my Tibetan everywhere. So oftentimes when 
you know, I'm starting a basic conversation in Tibetan, people will be like, oh, where did you learn Tibetan? And I'm like, well, Madison and Lhasa <laughs> and Kathmandu and Berkeley. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, the, the education was really cobbled together from all of these different experiences. And studying abroad, of course, was an important part of that. Wow, that's that's amazing. When I was an undergraduate, I had a similar experience where there there were some uh, Tibetan monks in residence. For, I don't remember if it was a semester or a year, but uh, they did the same thing. They did a, a mandala. Uh, you know, you can go to you could go to the student union and see them working away on the mandala for uh, for a week or a month or whatever it is, and then they, of course threw the whole thing into the ocean. Um, but at that time, it didn't seem to me like learning tibetan would even be possible you know it uh it you're you're very uh lucky well i guess it, we'll talk about that more later but it's getting more and more uh accessible for people to learn tibetan i guess um let's uh let's talk about your book tell me about your book um what what do you hope that people will take away from it well so the book is about this debate that occurred in the 15th century over the course of a series of texts um, between two Tibetan scholar monks about a tantric ritual practice uh, where you actually transform your body into a mantra. So your body becomes the celestial palace filled with Buddhas. And so this is basically like a very complex form of the basic tantric ritual act of sadhana in which you imagine yourself as a Buddha. So body mantra is a little more involved in the sense that you're not just imagining yourself as a Buddha, but as a palace filled with them. <laughs> um, right. So I was initially very drawn uh, to the primary sources because I was interested in the time period, but also very interested in ritual and the body. Um, and it seemed like this method of correlating each part of the body with an aspect of a kind of divine reality um, and arguing about how best to do it <laughs> um, was really intriguing um, and also promised to reveal more than was on the surface, right? So it was more clearly than about just, you know, intersectarian politics of the time and more than just about how to interpret a text and more than just about ritual mechanics. Um, there was the really interesting interplay of all different aspects of um, study and practice of Buddhism at, at that particular moment in time. And so that's what drew me to the materials, you know, this love of mandala, this love of an, or interest in questions around having a body, <laughs> uh, which is kind of a fraught thing in the Tibetan context, actually. So, you know, mainstream Buddhist attitudes towards the body can be a little bit well, I mean, to the outsider, sort of pessimistic. <laughs> like, you know, the body right. is, you know, something that can become an object of attachment very easily. So monastic practice, for instance, is, you know, focused on um, kind of avoiding any kind of attachment. So um, bodies, you know, pose, you know, problematic connections with desire and so forth. And so I was quite accustomed to those kind of negative representations of um, a kind of attachment to the body and an ensuing sense of self. Uh, and, th and then, you know, with the, in the tantric tradition, you have this kind of almost more body positive sense in that the body can be a kind of instrument for liberation. So if you can tap into the hidden potentialities of the body, which is something you learn to do through tantric initiation and practice, um, then you can actually become a Buddha, right? <laughs> so you can right. use that ritual practice, practices like body mandala to become a Buddha. So this really deep interest in the body, the kind of paradox around the body as simultaneously a uh, kind of curse, or at least a not a curse because it's something you've created yourself, right? It's the result of your karma. It's this like materialization of karma. And then also this very promising um, potential presented by the body uh, in the tantric context, that was very captivating to me. So what I expected to find was kind of competing discourses around the body and this debate. Uh, and instead I found some other stuff. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I found that was kind of interesting was that the debate texts themselves were just like chock full of citations of other texts. 
to the right. point where for one of the authors, like initially I couldn't even find his argument. You know, there were so many citations that I was struggling to hear what he was saying. Um, and so I reached a kind of point in my research where I realized that rather than trying to work around these citations, I needed to regard them as kind of the meat of the text. Like This is actually where the author's voices were coming through was in the way that they were hobbling together these different fragments of text and kind of building a new, um, kind of building a new body, building a new body mandala practice from these bits and pieces um, of other texts. And that also pointed out to me that you know, oftentimes when people encounter Buddhist texts and even beyond Buddhism, you know, even just, you know, any kind of cultural production from Asia, they notice repetition uh, in the form of, for example, citation, and oftentimes dismiss it as being meaningless uh, and right. a kind of evidence of some kind of lack of creativity. And I was just so struck the more time I spent with these citations how much these two authors managed to do with them and how incredibly innovative they were being um, in some of the, the moves they were making with the citations were very subtle, but they were actually kind of modifying the boundaries of how you could interpret a text, you know, what a text could mean by taking a little bit from here and a little bit from there and bringing one thing to bear on another. So, so that was a great interest to me. Uh, and so I started to really focus on this citational aspect of the text and think about how it connected with citation and repetition, particularly with regard to bodies, uh, even beyond the Tibetan context and beyond the 15th century. Right. I noticed, um, you know, some of the some of those sorts of practices, they sound almost um almost eerily contemporary to us now, right? And um, I, I thought it was very intriguing that your the, the subtitle of your book is A Contemporary Perspective on uh, Tibetan Buddhist Tantra. So uh, what, what sort of parallels do you think that um, this material from 15th century Tibet has with our, our, our current moment? Well, I think one of the the kind of interesting points of comparison is connected with citational practice and thinking about how acts of repetition that are um, linguistic but also physical um, can either uh, reinforce or destabilize the kind of norm, right? And this, of course, is an idea of citationality as introduced by Judith Butler, um, and I'm not suggesting that 15th century monks were, you know, <laughs> prophesying the appearance of Judith Butler or anything, but um, but there is some kind of interesting resonance um, between the two discourses in thinking about the way repetition is actually not just parroting, right? That actually you can really destabilize an original using a repetition, you can reinforce it. You can create something completely new. Um, and so that was one domain in which uh, I found some interesting connections. And then the other, you know, reason for the choice of the word contemporary had to do with the fact that I was dealing a lot in the realm of representation. So I was thinking about representations in their Buddhist sense, um, which, as I see it, really... Uh, is a multimedia definition that spans text, images, and bodies. So in Tibetan, the word ten is used to refer to all three. <laughs> um, wow. And yeah, and so and and all three really are regarded as kind of paradoxical and and charged, right? In the in that they have great potential, but also there are some pitfalls um, that one can fall into with with regard to them right so they can be instrumental but also problematic so i was thinking a lot about you know representation in our current moment uh, and the possibilities that representations provide for kind of expanding the horizon of possibility um and and also the ways in which as we start to document the history of representations we see 
how they've also kind of confined what seemed possible for people. Um, and so really thinking about this power of representation um, led me to look at, you know, who's really an expert in dealing with representations and, and really to look at the world of contemporary art um, and, and think through some of these issues there. So that was something in the epilogue of the book, I focused on a work by an artist named Glenn Ligon, who has a very deeply citational artistic practice. Um, and, and think about how Glenn Ligon helps to cultivate some of the same critical capacities in his viewers that these 15th century Tibetan Buddhist monks um, were in their readers um, through their kind of interpretive maneuvers. That's, that's amazing. Um, I, I really didn't expect uh, Tibetan Buddhism and um, contemporary uh, art to have these sorts of connections. And it sounds like it's a really interesting perspective on going both ways, maybe. <laughs> I was going to say on Tibetan on Tibetan Buddhism, but maybe on contemporary art as well. Um, uh, I also, so you, you mentioned about how you came across uh, Tibetan language and everything and how we, we talked about how it's becoming more and more uh, accessible for, for learners. So I wanted, uh, I wanted to ask if you could maybe say something about you have, in the past, you've led a program uh, to Bhutan with Arizona students. And you've also been a part of a program, a language program, a free online language program for students at the U of A and at University of Kansas. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yes. So in 2017, I led a group of students uh, on Arizona in Bhutan. And the theme of the program was spiritual ecology and Himalayan Buddhism. So what is spiritual ecology? Well, it's been defined as basically the different kinds of technologies that human beings use to connect self and world. So we thought about Buddhist technologies like ritual, like a mandala could be one way of connecting self and world. Um, and oftentimes people think about mandalas, not just as celestial palaces of Buddhas, but kind of like maps of the cosmos. Um, right. And so, so we looked at ritual phenomena, but also we thought much more broadly, um, thinking about, you know, the ways through environmental policy, one regulates the relationship between self and world. And also um, through medical practice and traditional medical practices in particular. Um, and so we really in this program were very much catering it to the different disciplinary backgrounds and interests of the students that came. And a major component of the course was that the students each designed a research project that they then pursued on the ground in Bhutan with mentorship. Um, so we had, you know, students really across the full gamut of the university um, working with experts in Bhutan to explore questions that they had created, you know, for themselves and getting like meaningful feedback from their peers along the way. I mean, it was pretty incredible. Our first day in Bhutan, we were in a museum looking at images and I heard one student say to the other one, oh, come over here. Like, this is totally relevant to your topic, you know? And I mean, I had this moment where I was like, well, my work's done. I can just go home now. But of course <laughs> it's I, happening. I wrote it out. Right. But I was so impressed, right. By they, we had already spent a couple of weeks, you know, talking about um, the projects. And so they were ready to go on the ground and also to kind of help each other in the process. So that was a really, um, special experience and also you know the students contemplated a lot about what it means to take pilgrimage in that course you know pilgrimage is another um, important way that people in the Himalayas kind of navigate the relationship between self and world um, and the last day of the program we actually did this track to this major uh, Buddhist pilgrimage site um, so that was a really cool way to end the journey. And we're hoping to do it again, uh, either in 2025 or 2026. So um, the program is currently under construction. So we've got a Facebook page, Arizona and Bhutan. If you want to go there and see amazing photos of some of the adventures we had last time. 
Um, but yeah, I, that was a really special experience for me and I'm really hoping to do it again with students. So students, interested students should stay tuned and uh, hopefully you'll be able to be uh, back in Bhutan soon. As, uh, how about how about the um, the Tibetan uh, the Tibetan language program with University of Kansas? So yeah, that's super exciting. Um, I've been interested, obviously, in sharing Tibetan with students since I arrived. Um, but you know, I'm very busy also teaching coursework uh, in the undergraduate and graduate curriculum. So I was delighted when our colleagues at the University of Kansas proposed a collaboration. Um, for us to work together to offer Tibetan language. So at present, uh, students from both universities can take courses uh, offered online, uh, hybrid. So if you're in Kansas, you can do it in person. Um, and Tibetan levels one and two um, to be able to get some familiarity with Tibetan language. And the long-term goal is that we'll begin offering the more advanced levels here as well, so that I could potentially lead a readings course um, in Tibetan Buddhist texts in the years to come. And this would provide a great opportunity for students who have, you know, grown invested in the many courses um, in Buddhist studies we have here uh, at the University of Arizona um, to kind of deepen their engagement with them. But also, even if you're not super interested in Buddhism, you know, there are a lot of fields in which uh, the study of the Himalayas is really crucial. Um, you know, people working in environmental science and um, geology, cultural geography, for example, um, all might, you know, have some reason to gain some familiarity with Tibetan language for field work. So we're hoping to really bring in some exciting students um, from across these universities um, and and get them involved in studying Tibetan language. Absolutely. Anyone who's going to be working in any of these regions uh, would do well to learn a little bit of language, right? It will make your life much easier, much better, and much more enjoyable. So to go, to go back to your own uh, research, what's next? So I have a couple of projects. The second book project is kind of riffing a little bit off of the interest in citation that uh, I explored in the first project to think more broadly about how repetition functions in Himalayan Buddhist sources um, across text, image, and practice. So think about different forms of repetition um, and what they're doing um, and creating an even more robust dialogue between those sources and contemporary artistic projects. Uh, so that's pretty ambitious and exciting also. It gives me an excuse to spend lots of time in museums, uh, which is something I love and also love to bring students to do when I have the opportunity to do so. Um, so, so that's pretty exciting, but also a big project. Um, and so I also have some smaller projects where I'm going a little deeper with these questions around representation to think about this category of appearance. So um, basically the Sakyapa tradition um, to which one of the protagonists in this debate belonged, um, thinks uh, it approaches the body in some sense as just one of many appearances to the mind. So the, everything we experience is really just a product of our minds um, and, and the body being one of them. So appearances are something that you experience um, according to this philosophy, but they're not truly real, right? So I want to really understand more about what that means. Like how could something be experienced but not really exist? <laughs> um, what exactly are these philosophers talking about and these ritual specialists talking about when they describe appearances in this way? And and what does that mean for the body? <laughs> um, so that's the kind of headier stuff that I'm um, getting entrenched in at the moment as well. Fantastic. Dr. DeShiel, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. For more information, please visit our website, ceas.arizona.edu. 